All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's NCARB Live. Today's webinar features architects and a current licensure candidate who will provide insight into the process of gaining real world experience at an architecture firm. Navigating AXP supervisor and mentor relationships and overcoming difficulties on their path to licensure. They will also be answering any questions you may have during the Q&A portion of our webinar. My name is Melissa Gobret. I am the manager of policy or one of the managers of policy and international relations here at NCARB and one of the architects on staff. Uh, I'm joined today by our three panelists, Colt Brock, Kimberly Tuttle, and Martine Padilla. We will all, you will you introduce yourselves and what you do? Colt, we'll start with you, sure. followed by Kimberly and Martin. Hi, everyone. My name is Colt Brock. I use he, him pronouns. I am the 2023-2024 president of the American Institute of Architecture Students and the 2024 student director on the AIA board of directors. Um, I am originally from Dallas, Texas. I went to school in Atlanta, Georgia, and did my undergraduate degree at Georgia Tech, uh, where I got my bachelor's of science in architecture, my pre-professional degree, and I am now located in Washington, D.C., Great to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kimberly Tuttle. Um, I am currently at Gensler. Uh, I'm the firm wide emerging talent program manager. Um, this conversation is relevant because um, my career in architecture uh, shifted about 10 years ago um, when I became a licensing advisor, or back then it was an intern community. Oh my gosh, IDP. Anyways, I don't remember the title, um, but I got really involved with NCARB and this community about 10 years ago, um, back when I was in Maine uh, as a licensure candidate and uh, ended up, once I got ended up moving to Washington, D.C. and working for NCARB and then now at Gensler, where I support all of our candidates um, through the licensure process. So excited to be here. Um, love talking with people uh, going through the path. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Padilla. I'm a, a licensing advisor, practicing architect for about 20 years, located in St. Louis, uh, a firm called Trivers. And I'm excited to be a part of the process to help uh, young people advocate for themselves in the process of licensure. I was the career advisor for the architecture students at Washington University in St. Louis for 10 years, also helping them along their path to reach that next level of professional experience. Um, also excited to tell my story of, about my licensure process, also involving the IDP program back when it was called that um, intern development program. I think that's what that stood for. Um, my my exam process is a, a long and very interesting journey, and I'm available to share after if anyone wants to hear it. But uh, I think mine is a, a story of resilience and trying to get through it. The other part is remembering that you're not alone in this process. And I think that's what brings us all together to understand how we can all best help each other. Thank you. We're glad to have all of you joining us today. Uh, so thank you all for your introductions. Before we get started, um, we want to kick things off by hearing from you. Uh, so you should see a poll asking, um, what is it, where you are on your licensure path. We will give each of you a moment to share answer. All right. Looks like we've got some results in. We've got about 17% seven, students here with us today. About 38% are earning their AXP experience. Uh, about 33% of you are in testing. And we've got maybe 21% already experienced architects. So thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, yep, looks like we covered that. We're going to now move into the panel discussion portion of the afternoon. After that, we'll open the session to answer any questions you all may have. So please feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A tool at any time. All right, uh, to get this conversation started, I'd like to know if any of you had a particular strategy for meeting the experience requirements. And for our licensing advisors, what strategies do you share with licensure candidates trying to navigate the AXP? Uh, why don't we get started with Kimberly? 
sure. Um, so don't do what I did because um, back then we were still, back then, I feel like, I feel so old. Um, back then we were still, we were just transitioning from the paper forms to the online forms. So you had to actually mail in your, um, and Martina, you're nodding like you, you remember that. So, um, you know, at that point there wasn't a, a time frame, a requirement. Um, but what I would say is I see a lot of um, students who maybe go and intern at a firm in the summer and they don't start their NCURB record. And so for me, one of the biggest things I can promote and to anyone that I talk to, regardless of whether or not they work here at Gensler for an internship or work outside at a different firm is to never leave your summer internship without getting your AXP signed off on um, because it is so hard. Um, I am an AXP supervisor as well. Um, I have a handful of students that I supervise every summer um, and it just becomes really hard when it's six okay, maybe not six months, three or four months later, and I get an email from the NCARP system saying, please go in and look. And then I have to go back and actually remember what it was that we did. Um, is that really accurate? Um, and sometimes if I'm busy, you know, some people are not great at managing their emails. I'm not one of them, but um, it can get lost. And so it is really hard to go up to someone. It is really easy to go up to someone while you're sitting next to them and say, hey, I have submitted um, my hours. Would you and I be able to sit down and have a quick conversation about it, ensure that this is, um, and actually, I'd actually have those conversations before you submit to ensure that what you are submitting is accurate and, and they're on board with it. Um, but it's so much harder when you're trying to reach them via email, you know, in November, December, when the holidays are coming up um, and, you know, they're probably just as busy, may not see your email. So stay on top of it, but also never leave your internship without getting that signed off on. So I'll hand it over and then we can come back to that. More things. All right, Colt, can you uh, share your um, strategies? Yeah, so I think a big thing for me was always, I have I always thought about it starting at the career, kind of I'm out of school now. <laughs> But talking about it from a, a student perspective a little bit is starting at your career fairs, um, understanding where your hours are. If you have no hours, then you're kind of in the easiest position because all the hours you get will be ones that you need. Um, uh, and all the trainings and uh, educational sessions I've sat in with and Carb, it's not about hours in the seat. It's about competency and, you know, understanding as you earn those hours. Um and so when you begin to identify places that you would like to work, it's during the interviews and during that process, having conversations about what your expected workload will be for the summer, what kind of things you'll be doing, and you can begin to calculate out the hours that you'll receive during that time. And then when you're emerging from school, maybe you've picked up and maybe even completed a uh, category or two of your AXP requirements. Uh, it's really having those discussions and understanding that not every place is going to be able to accommodate the hours that you might want or need when you need them. Um, and that does, does that count that place out? Maybe not. Maybe you'll learn a lot of other things on the job, but it's really talking to whoever the hiring manager is or your boss or whoever's interviewing you, maybe other young people in the firm, if you can get contact with them and having conversations about the expected, um, you know, hours that you'll receive, projects you'll be working on, things like that, because it could be, you could be like me and be <laughs> two years out of school and on paper, I should be done after, you know, doing some internships during school, two years out of school. But um, some of the firms I was at, I was not able to get certain categories based on the projects that I was working on. And so not that it held me back, I was able to learn a ton, but really understanding what you will be doing as you enter into a new phase, internship, new job. Um, I think is really, really important. Um, and then building a strong relationship with your project manager, or whoever will be signing off on your hours to make sure that, you know, you're not losing hours or missing hours or putting things in the wrong place uh, as well. So, yeah, it's a good strategy to be proactive. And Martine? Well, they both brought up two wonderful points. Um, Kimberly, I definitely remember the paper trail that was exhausted on my part. Um, I was one of those people that trailed behind in six months. And so I had to constantly, I was, one, if there was one thing I would recommend to myself, my, my past self would be consistency. You start early and be consistent about your progress. 
Um, and I'm even going to put in a plug for the NCARB AXP app here because a lot of our employees use that and it makes it super easy to keep an eye on the percentages that you need. And that also allows you to advocate for what experiences you want out of the firm. Um, I manage the emerging professionals in our office and we meet once a month and that includes the interns that come in over the summer. So when they come in, we I advocate for them to try to build their AXP record before they even leave for the summer. And so that is a part of it. I mean, not all firms are equal. Not all firms are going to have that built into their process. And so, but you could be a part of that to begin that process within the firm. Um, so advocacy and consistency are two of the biggest points that I would advocate um, and, or, and recommend. And then, you know, um, the other thing that was brought up is the idea of like, when you develop your AXP record, you can use that as a talking point in the interview process to so firms can see, you know, how far ahead you are and what you need to get and they can and you can have more uh, ability to, to control what experiences you get out of the, the firms that you go to yeah or if you could even keep track of your tasks too that's right yeah. Yeah. um thank you for sharing it can be difficult when you're first starting out so i'd mm -hmm. like to know what challenges if any did you face as an early career professional and how did you overcome them colt can you get us started sure i'll i'll answer in two ways uh one way I'll answer, which I'll kind of give my personal, is I spent the latter half of my school during COVID. <laughs> um, and so that was a very uh, different experience and hopefully one that we will not have to emulate or <laughs> repeat ever again. Um, during that time, it was really difficult, one, to even get internships, but two, is understanding the type of projects. There was a really big loss uh, in opportunities for on-site or doing project visits or in-person meetings with clients or anything like that. And so a lot of that kind of soft skill was lost during the time. Um, and so personally, that was a big hit that not just myself, but a lot of my peers and people around my age were facing. Um, I think on the other hand, it's kind of what I mentioned in the last one. It's knowing when is potentially the right time to ask for new work or to step out of your comfort zone when hey, I've completed all of my, I don't know, all my hours. I've done CA for the past three months. I really need to get out of this. It's having sometimes those uncomfortable conversations to say, I'm enjoying the work. I appreciate the work you're giving me. I'm learning a lot, but I'm not getting closer to being licensed or getting closer to taking my exams or anything of those sorts. And it's uh, what was really tough for me was that. And your managers and your bosses will not always be receptive to that, uh, just being totally honest. Uh, and that was tough because I got shut down a few times, uh, both in internships and then being out of school. Um, and so I definitely think understanding the right way to have those conversations and pitching them in a more like value prospect as a, like for everyone or for a different team as opposed to just for yourself, I think was really important. But those were definitely some things that all kind of layered on top of each other or <laughs> made for an interesting time. And then um, I think also, and, you know, there's been a lot of work done on this, but the transparency and clarity for both the record holders and for supervisors, I think has grown since I even started in school. I remember when I first started my record and there were so many more questions than I feel like I had answers to. And I think over the past few years that has gotten better, but um, as the process continues to get streamlined and, um, clarified, I think it'll continually help. And so some of the things maybe that I was going through and we talked about the, the paper submissions for IDP, I think we can, we've seen that things have continued to get better, but, um, I will also put in a small plug for the, the re-release of the AXP guides. Yeah. I went through them and they look fantastic. And I really <laughs> think they're much, much more clear. So if you haven't checked those out since they were released this month again, um, check them out. I was not told to say that as well, I'll add, but um, I really <laughs> do <for> the plug. <laughs> I, uh, genuinely think that the the clarity that has been coming in through the process and our supervisors and, you know, licensed architects that are signing off on hours being more comfortable with the process has helped people my age not have as much trouble getting your hours approved or um, things falling through the cracks as well. Thank you. And how about you, Martine? Uh, can you share some of your early career professional challenges and how you overcame them? Yeah. Um, you know, I just quickly, I wanted to add to his comment about the guides. Um, you know, one thing that is also done in, in within our firm is given the, the licensing supervisors agency in, in the process um, in terms of, you know, being able to guide uh, 
the experience component. And so I I wholeheartedly agree in the advocation of, of the wonderful guides that are produced by NCARB. Um, so early on in my career, I think the problem that I had was consistency in my progress. Obviously, the paperwork trail was never my strong point when, when I was at just out of school. Like I was more interested in some of the other parts of, of that. And so obviously it's a lot simpler now. And I think if you can develop that consistency early, it's amazing to be able to do that. Um, the other thing I think that is great is, you know, finding a buddy, a buddy within the firm or within the, another firm that you're doing this with. Um, I think I went through a transition period when, when I started to let others into my process, uh, into this experience, it really opened up an avenue for me to share my ups and downs and how to kind of get through that. And so finding someone that you can have these stories and share these conversations with, and then you can feed off each other's advice about how to deal with the, the fact that you might not be able to get the experiences that you need. There's ways to come to do that, just like he experienced. And so I think that would be one thing that I wish I had let others into my process early on. That would probably have made it a lot easier for me to, to go through this. So I think the point we're all here is that you're not alone in this process. And if you can find someone to help you through and guide you, it's critical. Yeah. A buddy is a good idea. We have great licensing advisors that are available to help you with that. And Kimberly yeah. is one of them. Uh, so you've been advising candidates for many years. What are the most common challenges you've seen early career professional space? Yeah, I see. And I, I have weekly conversations with candidates. Um, and I think the hardest thing that I see is that people don't start their NCARB records right away. And so, I mean, I think I, I spoke with someone last week and it was like, they had probably seven or eight years of experience and none of it documented. And I'm like, you would be so close <laughs> if you had just documented, you would you would be where you want to be right now if you had just documented. Um, and, and life, life gets in the way, right? Um, there's so many things that happen and life just can, totally derail. I mean, um, Martini talked about kind of just taking your time. I mean, even when I was going through it, I think it took me probably the first three and a half years to even think about documenting because again, we didn't have those requirements. Um, and the only reason I actually documented is because I was shifting firms. And so I made a very intentional play to ensure that those hours were signed off on. Um, and my supervisor was like, he pulled out a <laughs> calculator and was like, you haven't worked this much and tried to like completely reduce the hours. Um, so that was, that was a whole fun conversation. Um, but it was, I, you know, if I had been more intentional around it, I probably would have been done six months to a year earlier than what I, what I realistically was. And when I shifted to the new firm, I had a clearer picture around where I was lacking those hours and was able to then advocate for myself at that point. Um, and I think too, you know, Colt kind of alluded to it a little bit and that he didn't have a lot of support. Um, but at firms like ours, um, where I'm at now, we have, um, we call it a professional development um, program, PDP. Um, and you all probably have that in your annual reviews, essentially, and that is a really great um, PDPs here at Gensler are really focused on um, where you want to go in the next year. What are your career goals? And so we tell candidates, like, if you need something or you want to start taking your exams, that is the perfect opportunity and avenue to talk about that so that your supervisors are aware of your goals and can help support you as you continue to dive into that. So I think, you know, don't wait too long because life is just going to get busier and it's going to get tougher. And then you're going to try and have to figure out how to, um, you know, if family, you know, partners, whatever that is, it's going to get in the way. And so being able to kind of put your mind, you know, as you come out of school, if you feel ready, you know, start to really dig into that. Um, because the longer it takes, the longer you wait, the longer it takes. And so I think that kind of path to initial licensure could begin to shrink a little bit if we are all more intentional around um, trying to tackle that as soon as we're able to. Um, 
but yeah, those conversations when you're like, how long have you been working and you haven't reported any and you know, it's past and it's even, if it, it's even worse when it's past the five-year mark. Cause then you're just like, Oh, your heart sinks for them. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that we tend to see. Um, and those are, I think, kind of the most heartbreaking ones to, to have conversations with. Yeah. And if I can jump in really quickly as well, I'll add, I'm trying to wear two hats as the unlicensed person on the panel of um, testing as well. I would say a big thing I hear from my peers and people that graduated with me or that I work with who are emerging professionals, um, cost is a real thing, both personal hours and cost of materials and exam prep and the exams themselves. So um, reach out to other people in your area, reach out to your firm. They may offer um, funding for exams, but if you're not telling them you're taking them, if you're not <laughs> having conversations and to Martine's point, you know, building that community, you're not going to be able to tap into those resources. So reach out to local organizations. It could be AIA, NOMA, SARA, any number of other professional organizations that, um, work with architects and, you know, emerging professionals and also talk to your, yeah, your firm, you can call your state licensing board and see if they have any, your state or local licensing advisor, but cost is a real barrier for people. Um, and I'm not at the point where I'm beginning to take my exams yet, but for those that are, um, there are resources out there. You do have to look for them sometimes more than you may want to, but, um, I would encourage people to make sure that they are reaching out for those things and trying to identify those things in their communities and in their areas mm -hmm. so that they can re lessen that barrier, <laughs> uh, maybe. Can I jump off that really quickly though? Um, kind of back to what Martine said, when I was going through my exam, I had already moved firms. I had, um, was wrapping up my, at that point, IDP. Um, and there was another woman in my office who, um, was a little older than I was and had not gotten licensed. And so it was really interesting to join and immediately say, okay, I'm going to go get licensed now. And she was like, I'm going to go get licensed now. And then, so it was this, this fun kind of competition. Um, but the firm was really excited that both of us were really passionate about doing that. And so they then went ahead, even though they didn't have the resources before went ahead and purchased those. And so, um, you know, I, I hear from a lot of candidates that they don't want to share and I don't blame you. Like if you fail, I failed, I failed three divisions of the exam um, before I became a licensed architect. And I know it hurts um, and it, it can blindside you and set you back. Um, but I think it can be the, the buddy can be really impactful and can also be helpful for the firm to understand. Um, because for us, we're such a large global firm. Um, we have to also understand if we're spending that kind of money, how many people are actually using it and how many people need to use it and how many people are on the path and where, where are they at? And so we can properly invest the resources that we have towards the people who need it most. And so if you're not speaking up, um, we don't do it to be nosy. We do it to help ensure that we are helping you along the path. Um, and I would like to assume best intent from, from all employers, uh, who are doing that. So, um, and you can even ask your supervisor for, um, some confidentiality if you don't want other people to know, uh, and we encourage them to keep that for you, uh, and, but, you know, try to also help get you resources if you need them. Yeah. Um, so an important part of the architectural experience program is working with your supervisor to get your experience approved. Do any of you have tips for creating and maintaining a good relationship with your AXP supervisor or mentor? And we'll start again with Colt. Yeah, I think a big thing is transparency <laughs> um, and also having an understanding ahead of time, what I, I thankfully have not had this happen, but I've had plenty of peers go in and, you know, not have a conversation with whoever would be signing off on their hours. And then they get to the end and they're to Kimberly's point, their boss pulls out a calculator and says, you worked one and a half hours less than this. I'm not approving this. You need to re-report all your hours. Um, and which is extremely frustrating, especially if you're <laughs> uploading, you know, potentially three to four months worth of hours. But I'm saying all this to say, um, 
having a conversation towards the beginning of your time and working with that person about the best process for them, because despite your best efforts, you may go in and bulk upload three months, six months, um, even more if you've, you know, fallen behind, uh, and they may not be receptive to that. And they may not like the fact that you did that. And you don't want their opinion on the way in which you're handling your hours to be the reason that you have any hiccups in this process. Um, and so what I would say is, is starting early, um, whether it's, you're just starting your internship or you're just at a new firm, understanding who will be approving your hours and talking to them about the best way to do that. Hey, project manager, a, um, would it be best if I upload these every couple of weeks? Do you want me to do them every couple of months? Um, you know, I'm going to be out of town or, oh, my internship ends in September 1st. Like, should I try to get these to you sooner? Um, should I wait till after? Understanding really what the best process will be so that you don't lose anything in that transition or in that in-between time, I think is super important. And then um, building camaraderie with other unlicensed people in your firm, I think is really important, um, especially those that have been there longer than you, because if you can understand... <laughs> The way in which they're logging their hours, maybe they're getting um, someone else in the firm is doing that. It's not always your direct supervisor that will be approving your hours. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important to kind of build that community. You don't have to say this or that or the other. And then also um, the idea of uh, hours in the seat versus, you know, hours that you're learning. Some supervisors approach approving hours in different ways. Um, and if they if you are not on the same page about that, they may not give you all the hours that you think you've earned. Um, and then you may have actually learned less than what they're willing to give you in certain categories. So I, I, I do truly believe it's building that professional early relationship with whoever will be approving your hours um, as soon as possible. Uh, that's, that's something that has helped me a lot and has helped a lot of my peers as well. All right. And how about you, Kimberly? Yeah, you know, oftentimes I think you're super, so where we are, we have staffing plans, right? And so you have a pretty good indication of what you're going to be working on over the course of the coming weeks. And so I think that's a really great opportunity, even just sit down with your supervisor ahead of time and talk about what you hope to learn, um, kind of going back to hours versus competency and um, what you're hoping to learn over the next, you know, maybe two weeks. A lot of firms will do like a two week, um, you know, payroll every two weeks or, you know, every, you know, twice a month or something. But I think that's probably a really great opportunity to sit down and kind of plan ahead so that you can actually try and get what you need out of it. Um, and, and to be intentional around it, right? So I think part of the reason why it took me so long to go through my, my um, internship earlier on is because I wasn't intentional around reporting experience in certain categories. So I think by the time I left my first firm and went to my second firm, I had maybe under a hundred hours left, maybe like 45 hours left, but like probably 20 of it was in code research. And, and at that time, like you're not going to get that much code research on a small residential project, right? You might spend like two or three hours on a project doing some code research. And so that took me probably six or so months to get that experience. Whereas I had been doing it all along, but I hadn't reported it or looked at being intentional with it. So, you know, if you are able to kind of look forward and think, okay, how can I be, and this, I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but like, how can I be strategic about what opportunities I'm being given and looking at how they truly align um, so that you're getting the most out of, you know, your experience with them. Um, and then having that conversation and then following up and saying, here's what I learned. Here are the hours that I'm associating with that. Does that make sense to you? And if you do it, you know, every two weeks would probably be ideal. You know, I would start there um, because, we all forget. And I remember when I was practicing, trying to do my timesheet, 
from two weeks, you know, two weeks ago, it can be really hard to remember what you did back then. And so um, if you're doing it as you go, being intentional at the forefront and then coming back and circling back with your supervisor, I think that's a really great opportunity. Um, so, yeah. Martine? Yeah, Martine. Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they both hit great points. Uh, I would advise being an advocate for yourself and then creating a relationship, the, the, creating a relationship. I mean, the supervisor mentor relationship is, is at its best when it becomes transparent, when, when you allow yourself to be vulnerable to the ups and downs of what it is that you need. And so that's a part of this process. I mean, I've, you know, Kimberly mentioned, I failed many exams myself. And so, but part of that, the release portion of that was being able to let others in on that and let them support me and comfort me and, and, and have me understand that, you know, this is just another step and that you can get back up. And so creating a strong relationship with your with your mentor and supervisor early is, is an important part of that process. And it's going to be difficult to let yourself be vulnerable, but that is also a part of it uh, as much as you can. The advocacy part, I mean, I think that to me resonates with our firm is only 40 people, but we have a monthly program that is uh, all the emerging professionals meet together once a, once a month to, to see where everybody is. And it's not about, you know, hearing the ups or just celebrating the ups, but also understanding where people need support, um, whether it's ours or whether it's the exams. And that could be difficult for some to share. And so I've personally taken it, you know, I take it upon myself to be able to make myself available to them in more private moments to make sure that they feel still heard and supported in that part of the process. So if you can find a firm that can do that and give you what you need, that's great. Yeah, I mean, and everybody within all the emerging professionals within the firm advocated for themselves to get Amber Book for our firm. They made a strong case, all of them kind of gathered together and created almost this beautiful document that kind of showed, you know, what they're going to gain from it. We previously had had, you know, a meager sort of support uh, offering of what needed for studying, but they all made their case and they all advocated together to, to try to get better materials and they succeeded in that. So that's part of it. If you can build that community early, you guys can 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 be the starter for what's needed for all the support systems you need in place. Um, so Definitely. Yeah. And well, thank you all for those great tips, uh, especially the the proactive communication and setting that that stride with your supervisor. Um, so thank you for sharing with our attendees. Um, shifting gears a bit, uh, Kimberly and Martine, from your perspectives, as licensing advisors, how do you think candidates can take advantage of the support that licensing uh, advisors have to offer? So we'll start again with, well, this time we'll switch up and we'll go with Martine first. <laughs> um, so this, I was always a kid in the back of the, the classroom. I did well in school, but I was the one in the back. And I would say to, to those, engage and, and be proactive. You know, there's a whole host of things available to wherever you are, whether it's NCAR virtually or the local AIA or the local Young Architects Forum or, you know, NOMA, the NOMA groups or other architecture groups within your area that allow you to find all these different systems. So part of it is putting yourself out there and engaging with all these local systems in place already um, to be able to, to get what you need and, and get the support that you're looking for um, as much as you can quickly. I mean, <laughs> again, this is me basically trying to give myself the advice that I would have that would have been super helpful when I was a young person. Um, so with experience comes with that that component. So I would say just put yourself out there and, and be as engaged as you can to, to try to find all these different systems because they're there. They're out there within within every different city that you look that you all live in. Yeah, I think you know people think that licensure is some point later from now and now is not the time to be reporting and we want to go back and tell our younger selves like hey you should have been doing this <laughs> um exactly. Kimberly yeah. yeah yeah so I've been part of this licensure um champions community for licensing advisors excuse me um since 2011, so 13, 13 years. Um, and, and what I will say is it is an amazing group of people who are really excited uh, and 
passionate about helping you succeed. Um, and so I am I'm currently in DC. I'm the appointed advisor by AIA. AIA. I'm also the appointed advisor at the university I teach at, and then I'm also an advisor in my firm. Um, and so there are so many different ways. Um, I take more of a passive approach um, because I do get a lot of outreach and so spend a lot of time um, answering questions from students, but particularly within the firm, um, I support, we have a community called Licensure Champions and each of them kind of support each of our regions and offices. Um, and so they do a lot of the heavy lifting within the firm, but where I lean in is really because we're a global firm, we have a lot of um, international candidates and candidates who are looking to get licensed in the United States. And so those can be a little more tricky. Um, and sometimes, you know, I just like, I just want to hop on a call and like hear your story because everyone's circumstances are going to produce a different answer. And so I like to dive in one on one with each of those candidates to have those conversations because there's not one size fits all. Um, and if you try and do it in too big of a group scenario, it, you're just, you're, you're giving them kind of blanket answers that aren't really going to help them. Um, so I would say, don't be afraid to reach out. We love talking with you. We love engaging with you. Um, and we really are invested in your success. Um, so um, it's a really fantastic group of people. Um, the contact information, all of our information is online, so you can reach out. Um, but it's also better to reach out to the people who have greater exposure. So your state, um, people who are in your state or at your university, because every state is different, every jurisdiction is different. And so um, those people are more inclined to have a greater awareness of how to navigate your state's direct licensure requirements, right? I can have a conversation with someone in California, um, but I still have to do a little more research, whereas someone in California would probably be able right off the bat to kind of talk about that. So um, it's a really great group of people. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to your local advisor um, with any questions you have. Yeah, I was going to add um, for, I believe, I don't remember what percentage uh, on the call were students. Um, but I would say also starting when you're in school, you don't have to wait until you're out of school to start talking to licensing advisors. Most, um, if not all, all NAV accredited programs have faculty licensing advisors and a lot of them uh, have student licensing advisors as well. So I would encourage you to look online or ask um, in your school who that person is. We used to always have ours come every semester and give presentations to students on the process. And so as much as we loved NCARB staff and having them come in, it was fantastic to be able to have one of our peers, student peers, and then one of our professors come in and be able to talk with students about that and create a formalized space to have those discussions I also went to a non-accredited undergrad, so it was very different for me. Um, and we obviously were working with our master's students as well, but um, everyone is on a different step of the process and is on a different timeline. And so being able to understand from someone who is your peer and asking those hard or sometimes uncomfortable to ask questions um, mm -hmm. can be good. So yeah, don't, don't feel like you need to wait until you graduate or you're in the profession to start having this conversation. So just wanted to give a plug. And if you are a student, you can become a student licensing advisor and CARB does give great training and, uh, we always mm -hmm. support wanting to I was going to plug that. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you're, if this is interesting to you, by all means, um, sign mm -hmm. up to be a student advisor. And you can do that at advisors.org. You can email, email us, or excuse me, advisors at ncarb.org. You can email us there. <laughs> um, so let's move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Remember that you can ask any experience questions via the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. So our first question is, do you have any tips for finding a supportive firm? And let's start with Kimberly. Um. You know, it's funny. I do. I I, ha I host a lot of interviews as well, and students um, are very active in asking. So, what do you do to support licensure? Um, and so, that is a fantastic question um, to ask. Um, and any firm worth its salt um, probably has a 
a canned response. I mean, a, a response that accurately talks about what they do. Um, and everyone pretty much knows what it is that we offer. So um, I would say that's a pretty easy question to pitch to a firm um, and how they respond, I think, will, will help kind of uh, give you insight as to how um, supportive that they will be. And Colt, do you have any tips? Yeah, I kind of mentioned it earlier. And again, starting those conversations, even in your interview or at your career fair for students, but um, it's finding other people in your career stage, whether you're 23 and fresh out of school, looking to get licensed or you're 55 going to another firm and still unlicensed. It's identifying people who are on the similar path to you that you can have a conversation with because the canned answer, as Kimberly said, may all sometimes sound nice, but any firm that really cares about you and your path will get you in touch with those people. Um, even if that person may not say what they what you want to hear, um, they they will get you in touch with those people. And so it's not just talking to your people that are hiring because they're the ones that are very polished and prepped, but having some more candid conversations with um, people in that firm, I think is is really important. And then also just go out and talk, um, go to an AI meeting, go to any, you know, go to a, go to any membership organization meeting conversations happen. You will see people there. Don't gossip. I'm not encouraging that, but ask, um, or, you know, if someone you went to school with works there, like go and have those conversations. Cause it's understanding what is behind the, you know, the, the interview or behind the, the things like that. Um, too many times we've had students really get, uh, blinded or emerging professionals get blinded by the shine of the firm and then they get there and it's not always the experience that they want doesn't mean it's bad but it's not the experience that they were expecting so really try to push those conversations before you make decisions and understand what is or is not right for you martine yeah I mean, so a lot of times too if if an interviewee is asking all these very interesting questions about support what support they need it often reflects really well on, on the interviewee because they see you as someone who is proactive with their career path. And so I highly encourage everyone, I mean, you're, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you in that process. So go in there with questions about licensure and what, what study systems they have, what support groups they have, you know, what, what are you going to do to ensure that I get the AXP hours that I need? Um, you know, I, I don't think it's wrong of you to ask those questions every time you go to a firm. That, that's part of the advocacy process, and you should be able to ask those questions as you go through the process. You're you're getting to know them just as much as they're getting to know you. And you can always uh, see like our baseline on belonging uh, reports and see what questions are uh, people are being asked in terms of firm supported benefits. And you can always ask those questions of the firms when you're interviewing as well. Um, so another question we have is what can you do if you're struggling to connect with your supervisors? So let's start with Colt. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, Cause it's gonna, I'll say it differs for everyone, but what it, I mean, I think it's really about being transparent and finding time in very busy schedules to sit down. And also, um, I think Martine might've mentioned it earlier or someone mentioned it earlier, but finding someone else who can help advocate on your behalf and identifying someone else, whether they're licensed or unlicensed, it doesn't matter, but finding somebody else to help you advocate for yourself. You're not asking for them to <laughs> go out of their way to do anything that they shouldn't already be doing as your supervisor. Um, and so it could also be, and I'll say this is not always a, a popular answer, <laughs> but it could be identifying that you need to find a new advisor um, or a supervisor. You don't have to change your project teams or anything, but it could be more of a, hey, I'm on this project team, but I'm going to work weekly with this other licensed architect in our firm who works on similar projects to review the work I'm doing and have them sign off on my hours instead. That shouldn't be your first course of action, but um, I think it's being transparent, finding someone to advocate for you, and then just knowing that you don't have to leave the firm if your one supervisor isn't great, nor do you have to leave your project team. There are other options, but identifying ways to make sure that you are getting the support you need from the place that you're at um, is really just, you. it's 
not shouldn't have to be on you to to push for that but um also i will defer to ncar but you can always contact your licensing advisor or try to get some support from ncarb if there are any um really expressed or outspoken issues with your advisor hopefully they can advise you as well outside of you know just what we're saying here okay and uh we'll go with you martin yeah it, you know, it's it's interesting because a lot of firms can structure their supervisors differently. Ours, you know, you can pick your supervisor based on the projects that you're working on. Um, other firms might have one supervisor for the entire firm, no matter what the projects are. So it, it does depend. I think the best relationships are formed when you're within, you know, you have a supervisor that's also on your team because you have that connected bond between that and they have a deeper understanding of what it is that you're doing. And so... Um, if you can have that in place, I think I would advocate for that as much as possible. Um, and, and you might find that maybe you don't gel as well with someone and that's kind of a personality thing. But the goal here is for them to make sure that you are completing your competencies components. And that's that's the critical part. And so having someone who's that a part of the team that you're on and seeing the work that you're producing on a day to day basis, that's that's a huge part in that. Yeah. And do you have any tips, Kimberly? Yeah, um, I, I think there's a difference between supervisor and mentor. Um, as Martine said, you know, the supervisor's role is really to ensure you're meeting the competencies. Um, and sometimes you might not get along super well with them, but as long as they are not prohibiting your um, ability to continue um, advancing in your experience, you know, Sometimes we have to work with people we don't necessarily love. Um, and that that is the role of the mentor is that finding someone who can be your advocate, who can help guide, answer your questions, be a sounding board. Sometimes they're in your firm, sometimes they're not. Um, but then kind of going back, if you are struggling to connect, sometimes you just need to have a conversation with your supervisor. Um, you have to be open. You have to... Um, have a little humility in in that conversation um sometimes and i think you also need to assume best intent right because it can get hectic it can get crazy and we don't always realize as supervisors we don't always realize that we might be um not giving you everything that you need. Um, and so, and that, that can be purely extremely unintentional. Um, and until something is said, you might not, you know, it, I may not even notice I'm doing it until you say something. And so that could be, you know, it could be that. Um, I've had candidates talk to me about, you know, maybe they made a mistake and um, maybe the supervisor is having a little trouble um, trying to navigate how to properly guide you and have that tough conversation because they could be learning how to be a supervisor and as well. And so, um, you know, going up to them or finding some time, quiet time where they can sit and everyone can have a conversation about, you know, how am I doing? Um, am I doing well? Am I meeting expectations? Um, where, you know, I'm sensing a little bit of a disconnect, like what can I do to make this easier? So I think there are a couple different ways that you can approach it based on how you're feeling about it at the moment. Um, but I would always assume best intent because sometimes you're not going to get an answer immediately it's, you know things clients right <laughs> deadlines all of that can impact someone's ability to really kind of even life life gets in the way and we all can show up to work with you know trying to be our best selves and work is you know life is lifing in the background um, and so I think it's just having assuming best intent um, and trying to figure out, okay, how, if this is a me problem, how can I, what can I do? And if it's a you problem, <laughs> how can I advocate for myself to tell you what I need so that I'm getting what I need out of it? And then, you know, if that isn't working, then you go the other routes that kind of Colts and Martine had recommended. But um, I think you, you get to start with the, the conversation with your direct supervisor, you know, kind of that's where, that's the best place to start. Can I add to that? All right. 
first of all, I'm going to steal life is life. And I love that. That's amazing. Uh, I stole it too. <laughs> um, and I think the other component to this, because this becomes a kind of a relationship is going to this person, you know, don't always just go to this person when you need something or when you need some hours signed off. I think there's a, a process to it, like going out just for coffee to talk about your expectations beyond just the hours component. So creating that relationship where it isn't just about, you know, I, I need something or what do you need, but let's just get together just to talk about life or what, how's everything going between the two of you, things like that. So it isn't just about here's my hours, you know, I think that's, that's a huge part. And so Kimberly, that's a great point. Um, so we've got three more questions and we're starting to get close to time. So maybe what we'll do is have each of you answer one of them. Uh, do you have any tips for recent grads who are tra transitioning to full-time work for the first time? So Colt, maybe that's a good one for you. Sure. Yeah. I think when starting with when you're finding your firm, if licensure, if you are on the path and it's something you're working towards actively, don't uh, sit back right after you graduate and take too much time off. Enjoy yourself a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, transitioning out of school is great, but um, utilize that time when the things you learned in school are fresh as you're beginning to, you know, pick up all of your AXP hours, take advantage of, you know, the, the free time that you have outside of studio now um, and begin thinking about what that journey is going to look like for you. I think that's super important. Um, I have become victim. A lot of my peers have become victim of sitting back for too long and then life getting crazy. Um, and so, yeah, I would encourage people to really lean into utilizing that time when you still know how to study and you know how to do, do all of these things to really lean into um, taking those if that's something they're on. And then if not, I think it's, if you're like me and you have a background in a non-accredited um, school, um, really thinking about the next few years and what that path looks like for you. Education is not the only path. Um, and so understanding what your options are is really important. And then I think also talking to your licensed mentors, whether they're your actual supervisor, your licensing advisor or otherwise, and understanding what that path will look like and identifying mentors um, along that route as well. All right. Thank you. Can I um, chime in real quick? Sure. Um, real quick. So I think too, for Sorry, I totally lost it. <laughs> maybe it'll come back for you. It'll come away. back. I'll, I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Um, maybe this is a good one for you, Kimberly. Um, do you have any tips for networking in our profession? Mm, be open. Um, go. Yeah, your network is going to be your biggest asset and biggest resource to you. Um, since my very first job, and really, I don't know that I can I can say that about that. I have never had to cold interview for a job. Um, there has always been someone who has tapped me or said, hey, have you considered? Or, hey, you might be good at this. Um, and that has led to all of my career decisions that I have made um, pretty much since my first internship. And so leveraging your network, um, nurturing your network, um, going to events and just talking with people. I was very, very shy. Um, I hated public speaking, which I, I w went and worked for NCARB doing presentations three days, you know, three, day, three times a day. Um, but I was very shy. And so for those of you who are feel like you're more introverted, um, put yourself out there and you can do that, you know, have a couple questions in your back pocket, right? So Martine, what do you do, right? Those are super easy. We love to talk about ourselves, right? You ask us easy questions. We're going to, we're going to talk about ourselves. Um, and so go to networking events and just kind of casually try and get yourself off the wall. Don't be a wallflower. Um, have a couple of questions in your back pocket um, to start a conversation. And um, we also, I think the other thing is, and too, this, this is one thing I tell students all the time. Um, when you are trying to build your network and when you are trying to get a job, we know 
your end goal is to get a job. We absolutely know that. I also hate telling people no. <laughs> I hate it. I don't like disappointing people. I don't like telling people no. And so um, I absolutely really dislike when people come to me and right off the bat say, hey, can I get a job? Um, because oftentimes I that answer is not yes. Right. And so for me, um, and <laughs> starting to backfire a little bit, but for me, I tell people, come and say, you know, I'd love to talk with you more about your experience, or I'd love to get your feedback. Um, let me take you for coffee. Or do you know of anybody who would like to talk to me about this? And I say this often enough that now I'm getting a little bombarded about <laughs> with, with the request to talk to different people, but it's the, what I'm trying to get at is that it's the, what is the easy yes? right? How do you begin to get your foot in the door with a firm with an easy yes, as opposed to, I want a job. I know you want a job, but I don't have a job to give you right now. And if you, and I don't want to tell you no, right? So if you come at me and are like, I want a job and I'm like, I don't have a job. Um, it's so much easier for me to say, oh, sure. You, you want to talk to someone who's an interior designer? Yeah, absolutely. I know someone you can talk to. Here you go. And I could probably answer that in 30 seconds. Um, whereas if I have to say, no, I don't have a job. Will I respond to you? Most likely. Will it take me a little while? Absolutely. And so um, try and be intentional around how you foster those um, relationships, because we know at the end of the day, you want a job, but it can be about the person behind it. Um, having conversations, you know, Martine, where do you live? You know, what, what do you do outside of work? Like, those are the, the things that are going to build relationships for you. Um, you know, learning about their families or their hobbies um, and will make them want to continue to talk to you. Whereas if you just keep going up to people and like, I, I want a job and it's very clear that is the only thing on your mind, it, it, it can detract. Sorry, that was a very long-winded way of saying be intentional yeah. around how you engage. Um, it is a very small profession. Do not burn bridges um, because we will remember you for that in not a good way. Very small. Thank you, Kimberly. So we're, we're at time. Um, so really quickly, can we share our key takeaways? And let's start with you, Martine. Um, consistency, advocacy and relationship driven. Those are the key things that I think will, will take you far in terms of being able to develop um, the strategies and the support that you need to be able to succeed, whether it's AXP or professionally or the ARES. I think that's the kind of theme of this overall presentation. So those would be the, the core items that I would take away from this. Thank you. And Colt? Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is that everyone's path looks completely different. Um, and that we all, you can see between our, just our three and obviously most of your license as well. I know you didn't get into your path, but our four experiences of getting from starting school to licensed, if you even did go to school, um, all look very different and knowing that that doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, and leaning into your network, leaning into your community, finding a mentor, um, using the resources on hand, um, know that just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, so definitely lean into the people around you uh, if it's something that you really want to move forward with. Thank you. And Kimberly, your key takeaway. I would say own your journey and be intentional about it. Plus one to everything Martina and Colt have said. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for sharing. And a big thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today. We hope our program experts were able to answer all of your experience questions and help you feel more confident in your career path. If you couldn't see the entire webinar, you'll be able to watch a recording later on our YouTube channel. And lastly, stay in the loop on updates to NCARB's programs and the latest resources by following us on social media and at NCARB on all channels. Thanks and have a great afternoon.